Now, Dr. Fetcher, we said it before, and we're going to say it again. It really looks like nine out of ten of the JFK researchers, as much as we may have loved them and adored them and subscribed to their quarterly newsletter and sent them checks, we smell a rat. We smell a rat, Dr. Fetcher. We're going to start off with a Hoover and Johnson clip, and they may or may not be in this order. The multi-layered level of cover-up. Because from day one, from day one, literally from November 22nd, it had to be Oswald. Because nobody, the, the Warren Commission certainly could not look and say, well, the FBI didn't do a good job. Because Hoover had files on at least four guys on the Warren Commission. Earl Warren and Jerry Ford for extramarital stuff. Hale Boggs for his drinking. Um, seems to me there was something on McCloy and possibly John Sherman Cooper. The Warren Commission couldn't put any linkage between Hoover and Johnson. They couldn't say anything about organized crime because organized crime is linked to the CIA's dirty doings. They couldn't do anything about pro or anti Castro Cubans, because one of those groups is linked to the intel community and the military, and the other group is linked to, their, to the far right wing. So you bring in all the suspects and you have to eliminate them. But, but even though it was Oswald only, from the first day, there's a phone call from Hoover to Johnson. Late on Saturday, late on Saturday. And, and, and Johnson is saying, well, you know, what do we know at this point? So he said, well, we know that Oswald escaped from the book depository, which is a strange characterization to begin with. He escaped from the book depository. He made his way directly to the theater, and that's where he had the shootout and killed the police officer. Whoa. <laughs> Anybody that read the newspaper Saturday morning knew, knew the, a different story than that. And further along, Hoover said, we have positively identified this Alec Heidel person as a woman. Well, this, this particular tape, you know, I mean, there were several phone calls that Lyndon had with Hoover. And, of course, Lyndon was aware of the taping system and used it to create the impression he wanted history to convey. Michael Beschloss has done a study of these in Taking Charge, which is a generally good collection, though I think he misses that they were, a lot of them were scripted, but Hoover didn't do a very good job of staying on the script, and Johnson had to nudge him along, kind of drag him into getting all the points across, which LBJ himself filled in. I mean, the idea that uh, Alec Heidel was a woman is fascinating. Using the word escape, of course, is to beg the question and presume he was an assassin who was fleeing. So that was about uh, as well as uh, Edgar could do, I think, in trying to convey that impression through the use of language. As, as you are, I am hopeful that, that Ben Wecht continues to put forth the kind of programs that he has put forth. And believe me, when you see the professionalism that goes into to Ben's work, I don't know how much you know what goes on behind the scenes, but it's an incredible job. It is an incredible job. Um, and he just... He just takes care of it like it's, you know... Yeah, well, I mean, anybody and everybody was in Pittsburgh. So. All right, talk to me, Dr. Fetzer. Well, I'm not quite sure who... Who all was in Pittsburgh, but I can certainly tell you that David Lipton was not in Pittsburgh. I was not in Pittsburgh. I wonder if Doug Horn was in Pittsburgh. Those of us who have taken exception to the authenticity of the Zapruder film tend not to be included in these events. So if that's what uh, if that's what Walt Brown means by Ben Wex being so clever at arranging things, I think uh, he is very selective about who gets included and where one in the past where I was invited uh, turned out that Gary Aguilar and, and Josiah Thompson put pressure on Cyril to disinvite me. So that shows that a lot of this is window dressing and staging and doesn't really have a lot to do with who's making serious contributions to research on the assassination of JFK. 
and there wasn't any of the back sniping or whatever um, that you find as soon as you say almost anything in the Kennedy case, which which is unfortunate. Andy from Last Raw Bookshop always says, you know, we have met the enemy and they are us, and and he's right because you can you can sit down with somebody and agree on 999 facts. If you disagree on number 1,000. One of the, one of those two people is going to be convinced the other one's an idiot if they're agreeing on 999, and that's that's unfortunate. And that is not what moves research forward; it's what moves it backwards. And it's it's tragic. But we need to get the truth of what happened. Well, Dr. Fesser, it appears if it's anything to do with Oswald in the doorway or the Zapruder film, then you better stay clear of our conferences. Am I correct about that? Well, I'm sorry to say, Gary, it's ridiculous. I mean, the most important research has been on the, you know, discovering the alteration of the autopsy x-rays, the substitution of someone else's brain, proof that the magic bullet theory isn't even anatomically possible, mountains of proof that the Zapruder film has been completely revised to conceal the limo stop, the two shots to the head, uh, Cliff, uh, Clint Hill rushing forward, pushing Jackie down in the seat, lying across their bodies, peering into this fist size hole in the back of JFK's head and turning to his colleagues and giving them a thumbs down. One of the motorcycle patrolmen actually crossing the street in between the two limousines. Not to mention then that Oswald in the doorway, which guts the entire business and is, has to be the most single most important finding in the history of JFK research. So, you know, what we're talking about here is this Walt Brown is fixated on the trivialities. If he's saying you can agree on a thousand and disagree on a thousand one, and you're at each other's throats, these major findings about the Zapruder film having been altered, about Lee having been in the doorway, uh, you know, th this is non trivia. This is right at the heart of the. Uh, research on the assassination if you want to expose the truth. And I'm just sorry to say that, that there's uh, quite a few who are revealing by their failure to, you know, speak candidly about the evidence which are attempting to distort or dismissing the findings among the most important. It, it can't, it, it, they are either cognitively impaired or uh, seeking to suppress key findings. I mean, really, Gary, come right down to it. There isn't any other set of choices where it's embarrassing and shocking that Gordon Duff may well be right that when I said to him, I thought 50% of the JFK community was working the other side, he corrected me and said 90. I was floored then, but as you're observing, Gary, it seems to be the way things are playing out. Either you're talking about there's going to be no Copa because of John Judge, and there's going to be no Lance because they're retiring over there, but Sarah Wex is the place to be and the stuff. Here we go. There wasn't any of the back sniping or whatever um, that you find as soon as you say almost anything in the Kennedy case, which, which is unfortunate. Andy from Last to Raw Bookshop always says, you know, we have met the enemy and they are us, and, and he's right. Because you can you can sit down with somebody and agree on 999 facts. If you disagree on number 1,000, one of the, one of those two people is going to be convinced the other one's an idiot if they're agreeing on 999. And that's that's unfortunate. And that is not what moves research forward. It's what moves it backwards. And it's it's tragic. But we need to get the truth of what happens. It, it's unique in its collegiality. All right, Dr. Fesser, go ahead. Unique in its collegiality, except it would appear they'll exclude those who study the alteration of the film. They'll exclude those who study Lee Oswald in the doorway. They'll exclude those who study the role of Lyndon Johnson as the pivotal figure, the facilitator who made all these things come to pass. I must confess, I have been terribly distraught even about Cyril Weck, because as I got deeper into research on the HSCA, it just became in increasingly appalling to me how they could have shifted from the Bethesda autopsy report to their finding, which I'll remind those who may not have it at the forefront of their minds. We have all the witnesses from Parkland Hospital, from Dealey Plaza, and even some at Bethesda, 
who report this fist-sized wound at the back of JFK's head. Clint Hill was the first to see it up close and personal. He's remained consistent about it for more than 50 years. He even reports it in the book about the Kennedy detail recently published. If you want to get more on Clint, go to my article, uh, JFK, Who's Telling the Truth, Clint Hill or the Zapruder film. Uh, but uh, when it came to Bethesda after the body was taken there surreptitiously in a body bag out of the far side of Air Force One when the non-ceremonial casket was being offloaded with the tremendous attention, but the public not realizing it was actually empty. And the, the body was being taken by a helicopter to Walter Reed, so the leading military pathologist could remove bullet slugs so there wouldn't be too many or too few or of the wrong caliber. Well, then the body was sent over to Bethesda in a, in a body bag inside of a pinkish gray shipping casket, the kind being used then to bring bodies back from Vietnam, in a black hearse. Uh, the body was already undergoing autopsy, and Gerald Custer, who was taking the x-rays, was headed upstairs to have some developed when he looked out the window and saw the gray ceremonial, the gray uh, Navy ambulance and uh, with a ceremonial casket, and, and Jackie Kennedy coming in the front, and she, he asked himself, what in the world's going on here? What, what we know is that uh, James Humes, and this is principally from the research uh, done by the Assassination Records Review Board and reported by Doug Horn, including in his masterful five-part volume inside the ARRB published in 2009, that Commander Humes, in charge of the autopsy, took a cranial saw to the skull of JFK to enlarge in that fist-sized wound so that it would look more like something that could have occurred from a, by a shot from behind. Unfortunately, there were two witnesses, or should I say for history, fortuitously, namely Thomas Evan Robinson, who would be the coroner who would prepare the body for burial, and Ed Reed, who was a technician there at Bethesda, watched him do it. So that when the ARRB came to Dallas to depose witnesses, including Thomas Evan Robinson, when he was shown a diagram drawn by Jay Thornton Boswell with a sketchy lines around the side, he explained, oh no, the doctors did that and explained how they used the saw to increase the size of the wound so that if we regard what was the, uh, observed at Parkland as uh, the heel, uh, by the time uh, Bethesda is done, and in their description of the wound in the autopsy report, which I published as an appendix in the assassination science, has become the size of a foot. So it's enormously larger. In fact, David Lifton was so struck by the dimensions of this wound that he made a point of calling an expert and said, Describe the wound based on the autopsy report and said, what does that sound like to you? And he said, it sounded as though the person had been hit in the head with an axe. I mean, it's monstrous. So what happens when the HFCA reinvestigates? They conclude that whereas the Warren Commission had maintained that JFK was hit in the back of the head in the vicinity of the occipital, external occipital protuberance, that little bump on the back of your head where you'd recline if you were in a bathtub, uh, they moved it up four inches to the crown of the head and said that was the entry wound, completely ignoring the reports from Parkland and the report from Bethesda. So I called Cyril, and because he was a member of the medical panel, I said, Cyril, I said, how did the HFCA medical panel account for the enormous contraction of the wound for the massive gaping, missing at least a third of the skull back of the head in the Bethesda autopsy report to the small wound at the top of the head. And I was dumbfounded, Gary, when he said to me, I'll have to check my notes. Oh, man. Oh, it's painful, Dr. Fetzer. All right. Um, here we go. Wald Brown going to have to narrow the fact from the fiction, and it's time to club Madeline Brown. Well, the first thing is you have to somehow effectively narrow down all of the so-called ideas and separate the, the reality from the unreal. There's way too much out there that is simply based on one cherry-picked factoid, and it's not corroborated. The stuff is not being viewed through the eyes of someone 
who would have to take that evidence to a grand jury to make it stick. And as a result, you get you get stuff out there that's just just it's nonsense. But it finds its way into the literature, and and people feed off it. So the first thing that you have to do is make sure that what you're working with, the information you're working with, is solid information. And if it's not solid, you need to note that. You can still work with it, but you got to say, hey, <laughs> I don't know if this is trustworthy or not. I did a couple interviews with, with Madeline Brown back in the early 90s, and she told me all about the so-called famous Murkison party. And as time passed, the number of people at that party went from eight until uh, up to 40-some-odd. And, and I called her, and I said, Madeline, I got a tape recording I made of you when there were eight people at that party, and that was 40-some-odd. And she hemmed and hawed, but basically she was selling a story. And that's all it was was a story, because some of her 40 some just absolutely weren't at any such gathering, um, not by any stretch of the imagination. But it was a good story to sell. Uh, so you have to be discerning. From there, you have to look at just, just what makes sense. And you have to backtrack on your own. I smell a fallacy in there, Dr. Fetzer. What a mass of rubbish coming from Walt Brown. I can't believe I'm even hearing these words coming from his mouth. They're very, very revealing. I had over 100 conversations with Madeline Duncan Brown. I interviewed her at JFK Lancer in 1998. You can still obtain it online. I know her story backwards and forward. She was invited to the event at the Murkison home the night before the assassination because her relationship with Lyndon was well known. They had begun an affair in 1948. She'd born him a son, Stephen, in 1950, not his only child out of wedlock, but his only male offspring. She went there and found it was not a large gathering. Uh, 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 several dozen might have been as many as 40. But what Walt Brown is confounding is this much smaller group that went into the conference room to have the discussion about the assassination. I mean, those who were there included J. Edgar Hoover, uh, Madeline initially thought that it was in his honor that this event was being held. Richard Nixon, she remembered he had been driven out there by a local Republican leader who lived, worked in the same bank building where she was a young advertising executive. Uh, George Brown, Brown and Root Heavy Construction, when the Vietnam War went down, Brown and Root was given a billion dollars to dredge a new port at Conron Bay. Even though Vietnam has many magnificent natural ports, and I'm quite sure one was not needed, Interestingly, John J. McCoy, our former High Commissioner to Germany and former CEO of Chase Manhattan Bank, who, when Lyndon would put together the Warren Commission in order to preclude other investigations that might have got too close to the truth, he appointed two senators, Richard, Rich Richard Russell and John Sherman Cooper, two members of the House, Gerald Ford and Hale Boggs, and two civilians where one of the civilian appointments went to Alan Dulles, who JFK, of course, had fired as director of the CIA, although with great ceremony, uh, and then John J. McCloy. So, you know, Lyndon was covering all his bases. He knew exactly what he was doing. Um, H.L. Hunt, of course, was also there, too. And, and these heavy hitters disappeared into a boardroom for 15 or 20 minutes, and when it broke up, Lyndon strode over to Madeline, and while she expected he was going to whisper sweet nothings in her ear, instead he said in a hateful tone of voice, uh, I'm not going to put up with embarrassment from those Kennedy boys after tomorrow. He said, that's not a threat, that's a promise. Six weeks later, during a rendezvous at the Driscoll Hotel, Madeline confronted him with rumors rampant in Dallas at the time that he'd been involved since no one stood to gain more personally. Lyndon blew up at her and told her that the CIA and the oil boys had decided that he had to be taken out. That story has been corroborated by Billy Saul Estes, who told William Raymond, a French investigative reporter, that Lyndon had sent Cliff Carter, his chief administrative assistant, down to Dallas to make sure all the pieces were in place, all the arrangements were in place for the assassination. Billy Saul, who was, of course, a Texas Wheeler dealer, made a lot of money on scams for Lyndon Johnson, John Connolly, and their cronies. Uh, also uh, it, it had conversation with Cliff Carter and, and with Malcolm Mack Wallace, Lyndon's personal hitman, who murdered a dozen people on behalf of Lyndon, including one of his own sisters, both before and after the assassination, became convinced they were deeply involved in the event. Uh, there's a lot of other corroborating evidence about this. But among others, uh, Nigel Turner, 
nobody's fool when it comes to JFK. Vetted Madeline's story, had it corroborated by the chauffeur who had driven J. Edgar Hoover out to the meeting, and by the uh, chef who had prepared the hors d'oeuvres. He made it the final segment of The Men Who Killed Kennedy, uh, Part 9, The Guilty Men, which was so much right on target that Lady Bird got very upset. Uh, Jack Valenti got very upset. Bill Moyers got very upset. They put tremendous pressure on the Discovery Channel not to rebroadcast it, and they actually put together a, a, a fake grouping of historians, one of whom was a historian of urban sociology, another historian of constitutional law, right here from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, coincidentally, and the third was Robert Dalek, who knew a fair amount about JFK's life, but almost nothing about the assassination, who all three solemnly intoned that no LBJ could have had nothing to do with it was far-fetched and ridiculous. But in fact, all the evidence substantiates that there's a great deal more. I say to Walt Brown, stop pretending you're an expert on JFK because the rubbish you're, you're shoveling can't withstand critical scrutiny. And I find it embarrassing and shocking to hear him making such claims. He, he obviously didn't have the intelligence to differentiate between the smaller group that went into the boardroom to have the private up-close meeting final determination of... Uh, the fate of JFK and the larger group that was present for the social event at the Merkinson home. Dr. Fetzer, you're, you're wrong. LBJ was just a gutless coward. I did find uh, it uh, interesting that on the 50th uh, anniversary, there were so many books uh, pinning LBJ to being, uh, well, yeah. one of them was the mastermind, yeah. but it seemed like a whole new era at that, of course, LBJ ordered everything. He was in charge. LBJ was a gutless coward. He, I don't think, he, in his wildest imaginings, he could have been the mastermind. Did he have advanced knowledge? I believe he did. I believe he and Hoover had to be cleared. And once they were, once they nodded their head yes, then then it was clear sailing because the White House and the FBI were not going to, you know, open up Pandora's box. But Johnson. A, a political following gathered around LBJ in, in 1958 into 1959. Uh, just a, a coterie of really high-level political advisors, you know, kingmakers. And they were given LBJ all kinds. Of, Listen, you got to go. You got to enter some primaries. You got to go all over the country like this kid Kennedy is doing. Of course, Johnson thought nothing of Kennedy, and Johnson refused enter any primaries he would not go in any primaries and I read somewhere recently that you know Johnson and Kennedy hated each other Johnson hated Kennedy so much after the primary battles they fought with each other and they were never in a primary because Johnson wasn't in any he didn't declare his candidacy until the, con the Democratic Convention opened out in Los Angeles because if he had declared his candidacy January 2nd, the same day John Kennedy did, certain states automatically put all declared candidates into their state primaries. And Johnson, from his childhood of, of poverty and neglect and you know being looked down by the townspeople where, where he grew up in, in Hill Country, he was terrified of losing a primary. So he, he got in no way involved. In, and, and these people that gather around them gradually drifted away and went to work for Hubert Humphrey or somebody else, but they, they realized Johnson Johnson's ship wasn't going to float. Uh, he thought he could broker some kind of settlement in the, in the smoke-filled room after a couple of ballots if nobody was chosen. But Kennedy was picked on the first ballot by the last state in the alphabet, Wyoming. Uh, Johnson got hundreds of speaking invitations and from folks that weren't excited about the prospect of a Demo Democratic Catholic candidate. And a letter would go out saying, yeah, yeah, I'd be glad to be there. And then a week before, whatever it was, Johnson's office would send out a letter and he'd cancel. And he just wasn't taking these opportunities. And Kennedy was taking every one of them. He was just crisscrossing the country uh, in, in his private jet, which was a whole new facet of the political landscape. Uh, Johnson Johnson was just a gutless coward. You know, Kennedy sent them here, there, and everywhere. 
either to get him out of Washington or to make the vice presidency seem meaningful. And Johnson would load load the plane up with cases of booze, and he'd he'd be sloshed off his butt half the time he was out of the country, simply because he knew he was he was a non-entity. Uh, and I cannot imagine him organizing what was done. All right, Dr. Fetzer, LBJ was a drunken, gutless, sloshing coward. Go ahead. The superficiality of Walt Brown's understanding of Lyndon Johnson is appalling. He's obviously never studied Robert Carroll's books about the early years of Lyndon Johnson, much less Bill Nelson's masterpiece about the role of Lyndon Johnson in, as a facilitator of the assassination. Len Osanic loves to indulge in a straw man by saying that Lyndon had to pick every location for every shooter, which weapon they use, how many bullets, and what manufacturer. How dumb is that? This is insulting stuff coming from Lynn O'Sanic, and absolute rubbish coming from Walt Brown. It is embarrassing. You notice he never cites any books, any sources. I'll give you book after book after book. Begin with uh, Texas in the Morning, Madeline Duncan Brown. Begin with Billy Saul Essence, a Texas legend, which he modestly named after himself. Begin with Blood, Money, Power by Barb McClellan, where he was working for the most powerful attorney in Texas, who was helping Linda to plan the assassination and the cover-up. Uh, go to E. Howard Hunt's final confessions, where he explained to his son, St. John, that the chain of command for the assassination went from Lyndon Johnson to Cord Meyer to David Attlee Phillips to William Harvey to David Sanchez Morales and down to the actual shooters on the ground, their coordinators and supervisors who included George H.W. Bush and Edward Lansdale, who appears to have been the person who arranged where the shooters would be positioned and the sequence in which the shots would be taken. Or look at the more recent book by Roger Stone entitled uh, Who Killed uh, JFK, The Case Against LBJ, which is quite fascinating because Roger Stone comes from the right uh, wing of the political parties. He was uh, an assistant to Richard Nixon. He helped George W. Bush become elected in Florida, going through all kinds of machinations and manipulations. Go to Jack Ruby, for God's sake. Jack Ruby was telling the reporters that if someone else had been vice president, this would never have happened. And they, they, he was that like Stevenson is an example. And they asked for confirmation. They said, you're talking about the man in the position now. And Ruby confirmed, yes, it was. So we're talking about people who knew Lyndon Johnson up close and personal here across the board. I mean, it's just embarrassing to hear someone like Walt Brown seem to be an expert on the assassination. This is really completely appalling, totally inexcusable, and that Len Osanic is indulging it is, is, is beyond belief. All right, Dr. Fesser, take us out. We're going to have about a minute and a half to comment after this clip. Um, a recent book citing LBJ as the mastermind of the assassination, which is something I don't find myself supporting. Uh, it just from nowhere, it said Johnson arranged to make sure that there were no law enforcement officers of any kind after the car turned off a of Main Street. And that's nonsense. I've read affidavits of 15 Dallas cops that were on duty between the corner of Main Street and the Stenman's overpass. So there were police there. Uh, and to say that there weren't, it's just, just it's a leap of faith. And it's a leap of faith to prove a thesis that's unprovable. So in, in terms of doing any kind of research or, or pointing towards anything, you've got to really separate the, the buckwheat from the bull dorm. You have to. Sounds like he's talking to Phil Nelson about the buckwheat and the bull this dorm. This is unbelievable. He doesn't even know that Lyndon Johnson forced himself on the ticket in Los Angeles in 1960. Uh, JFK had already extended the invitation to Stuart Symington, uh, and Bobby made a pro forma gesture to Lyndon expecting he would turn it down because he wouldn't want to surrender his powerful position as majority leader of the Senate to, to be a vice president, uh, and was dumbfounded when he leaped on it using information from J. Edgar Hoover. He told Bobby that if he weren't on the ticket, he'd expose that JFK had had liaisons with beautiful women who were East German spies, that he had Addison's disease, wasn't expected to live a long, healthy life, and that if he were not on the ticket, then as majority leader, he'd make sure any legislative proposals sent down by the White House were dead on arrival.
Moreover, and this is uh, not quite as central, but just as telling in relation to Walt Brown's ignorance about JFK, uh, Bill Decker, the sheriff of Dallas County, who ran it with an iron hand, instructed that there should be no law enforcement responsibility after the vehicle had turned from from Houston onto Elm Street. So, you know, Walt Brown is just demonstrating he's incompetent when it comes to JFK. Leno Sanic is indulging him and supporting him. It's an embarrassment to the research community uh, that these people should be uh, paraded as though they were experts on JFK. Gary, I'm sorry to say, but this is a travesty beyond belief. Embarrassing. We'll be right back with a researcher alert, JFK researcher alert. This is The Real Deal with Dr. James Fesser and Gary King. We'll be right back.